Uh, thank you all so much, and thank you, Deepak, for uh, a wonderful meeting with an amazing group of speakers. Uh, what I'd like to do in the very short time I have this morning is to just give you a little bit of a feel for this new book that I've written with this title, The Emotional Life of Your Brain, uh, and talk about how uh, uh, emotions are varied across people. The, the, this is the insight that really motivated my entire scientific career to date, which is that in response to emotional challenges, to life slings and arrows, different people respond differently. And what is it about uh, the brain and emotion that helps us understand that, and how can we uh, uh, change people? How can we nudge people along in a more positive direction? So. Uh, I talk about individual differences in emotional or affective style, and these differences are key to understanding temperament and personality. They're also critical for understanding why one person may be vulnerable to um, particular kinds of uh, psychopathology, and other individuals may be completely resilient. Um, they're also critical for understanding how uh, the brain and the body interact together to modulate differences among people in susceptibility to certain physical illnesses. Um, why are certain individuals, for example, more susceptible to inflammatory disorders, something that um, uh, Candace and others have mentioned in previous talks. And finally, these differences among people are absolutely key to understanding resilience. Uh, and resilience can be thought of as the maintenance of high levels of well-being in the face of adversity. So these are the six emotional styles that I describe in my book, and I'm not going to, uh, uh, I don't have time to go through each of them, but I'll just tell you a little bit about each. Um, these are not obvious ones. They, they don't correspond uh, to traditional personality categories. They don't correspond to information that we've gleaned from the world of psychiatry, from psychiatric diagnosis. This really comes from uh, 30 years of neuroscientific research on the brain. Um, the first is resilience, and it refers to the rapidity with which people recover from adversity, from stressful events. The outlook dimension is a dimension that refers to differences among people in the persistence of positive emotions. The third style refers to social intuition, which refers to a dimension of how sensitive we are to the social and emotional cues of others, which can be expressed in the face, in the body, in the voice, and in many other channels. The third is self-awareness. How aware are we of the internal signals in our body that may be important for our emotional life? The fifth is context. Uh, and what I mean here is the differences among people in the extent to which emotional behavior is modulated based upon the context in which they find themselves. Uh, uh, for example, in response to a very traumatic context, certain kinds of emotional responses would be very adaptive, but those responses would be highly maladaptive if they occurred in a very safe situation. And finally, the last uh, dimension is attention. Uh, and attention is so important because it's intimately connected to emotion. Uh, and here is the dimension that can range from being very scattered to being very focused. And now I'll, I'll tell you about a few of them, but I'll do it in the context of uh, the uh, kind of broad frame of the uh, research in which we're currently engaged. And that frame is really captured in this slide. And what, uh, what this means is that these styles that I've described, these dimensions, are quite stable over time in uh, normal adults, but based upon understanding of neuroplasticity on the circuits in the brain that uh, are important for each of these styles, we know that they can be transformed, and they can be transformed through mental practice. So here, the idea that we can change our brain by transforming our mind is center stage. 
So I want to begin with a very brief autobiographical interlude. I'm a neuroscientist and a psychologist by training. And in the mid-1970s, when I was in graduate school, I had the great fortune of being around a number of people whose demeanor was something that was very uh, infectious to me. These are people that I really wanted to spend a lot of time around, and they weren't my professors. Uh, they were people outside the academy, and one of the things I learned about these people that they had in common is a practice of meditation. And in, in the middle of my graduate career, after my second year of graduate school, I went off to India for the first time. This was in 1974 uh, to experience my first taste of the potential benefits of intensive meditation practice. And uh, this was a seminal experience for me, and I came back with the fervent aspiration to do research on this topic. But it was very clear to me that the zeitgeist at the time was not receptive to this at all. My, uh, one of my senior professors put his uh, hand on my knee, and he said, Richie, if you want a successful career in science, this is not a very good way for you to begin. And I was encouraged to pursue other topics. And I, in fact, um, did a lot of research on emotion in the brain, which in part is what I'll be um, alluding to. But uh, I had a personal interest in meditation that persisted all of this time. And it wasn't until 1992, when I first met His Holiness the Dalai Lama, that that all completely changed. In that meeting, which was held in his residence in Dharamsala, India, uh, in 1992, he challenged me. And he said, look, you guys are using the tools of modern neuroscience to study fear and anxiety and depression. Why can't you use those same tools to study kindness and compassion? And there really was no good answer for that other than that it's hard. But you know, when we first began to study fear and anxiety, that was hard too. Uh, and I made a commitment to His Holiness on that day in 1992 that I was going to do everything I could to put compassion on the scientific horizon, on the scientific map. And if you go back to textbooks of neuroscience and psychology at that time, I think it's fair to say that not a single one of those serious textbooks included the word compassion in the index. And I think if you do that today, you'll see that the times are really changing. So this is a picture that was taken in 2001 of His Holiness visiting my lab uh, in Madison. He's been there a number of times um, since. Uh, and uh, uh, he has been a very directly involved in some of our work, uh, and particularly in the work that we began to do with long-term meditation practitioners that we flew from Asia to the United States uh, to spend several days in residence in our lab at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, and His Holiness has been our uh, chief recruiter for these participants uh, to bring the right kind of people uh, into the laboratory. Um, so let me uh, now tell you a little bit about a few of these emotional styles and also how they can be transformed. Um, the first is resilience, which, as I mentioned, refers to the rapidity with which we recover from adversity. And um, in other work, we've called this affective chronometry, referring to the time course over which emotions occur. And this is a figure of two hypothetical people, uh, person A and person B. And imagine some adverse event occurred, which elicits activation in one or another um, biological system, uh, and so that's depicted by these curves going up. And I've drawn these curves so that the amplitude of the response in person A and person B is the same. But you can see that the way I've drawn this, person B recovers much more quickly compared to person A. Now this kind of recovery can be tracked with great precision in the brain, in the body, in different kinds of biological systems. And uh, these patterns of recovery are extremely important for our understanding of well-being. 
Now it turns out that they can be transformed, this kind of time course. These are very new data. They're not yet published from a very new study that we just completed with very long-term practitioners uh, in our laboratory. These are um, practitioners in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. They've all done at least one three-year retreat. So during that three-year retreat, they were engaged in systematic practice for a minimum of eight hours a day for every day for three consecutive years, and they did not leave the retreat site for three consecutive years. Uh, the average uh, uh, amount of practice of these individuals across their lifetime was about 34,000 hours. So um, these are serious athletes of the mind. And one of the ways we probe this is by presenting a really strong adverse stimulus to, the, to them, which in this case was pain. Uh, and we can deliver physical pain very, very safely in the laboratory. We, we do it with thermal pain, so it's heat. It's a very realistic burning sensation. It's presented on the arm, and it's very intense. But we can do it in a way which is very safe. And what I want to just show you is one or two things about how practitioners respond differently. First of all, when you ask them to rate the intensity and the unpleasantness of their pain, you see something very, very interesting. Unpleasantness you can think of as kind of a metric of suffering. And you can see that the expert practitioners in red um, are, um, are telling us that they are suffering much less in response to this very intense physical stimulus. Now, one of the ways that we probe this in the laboratory is we give them a cue that occurs 10 seconds before we deliver the pain, and the cue says, in 10 seconds, you're about to get zapped with a very strong physical pain. Now, when you do that to novices, what you see is when the cue is presented, no pain, just the cue, you see the brain and the body immediately start to react. And that's because most of us are living most of the time not in the present moment. So when that cue is telling us that we're about to get the pain in 10 seconds, our brains and bodies really go haywire. Well, in the long-term practitioners, that's very, very different. And um, this is a very complicated slide. But uh, in this graph that I've circled here, um, what you see is, again, in red are the long-term practitioners, in blue are the novices, and this is representing activation in different regions of the brain that we know to be very important in pain. It's called the pain matrix. Uh, during this anticipation period, before the pain is actually delivered, and what you can see is the novices are showing strong activation during this period, and the practitioners are showing very, very little, if any, activation during this period. And then in the bottom here, um, what we're presenting are data showing that the average lifetime length of practice in these long-term practitioners predicts the magnitude of activation in the pain matrix during this anticipation period, which suggests that the more practice that these individuals were engaged in, the less activation there is during this period of anticipation, suggesting that they're really able to stay in the moment even though they know that they're going to be zapped with a strong physical pain in just a few seconds. And it turns out they also habituate quickly to this and over trials, successive experimental trials, they show a reduction in their response, suggesting that they are also recovering quickly from adversity. So these are um, some questions that I actually have in my book about um, you, where you can assess yourself on your resilience style. Uh, and they're questions like, if another driver sneaks into a parking space that I've been patiently waiting for, I am likely to shake it off easily rather than fume about it for a long time. Those are the kind of um, everyday activities where the resilience dimension is reflected. I won't read these in the interest of time. Let me talk a little bit about the outlook style, which is the capacity to maintain positive emotion, and just go right into showing how this is a characteristic that can be, in fact, enhanced through mental training. Now, here I won't show you data from long-term practitioners, because one of the things I'm frequently asked 
is, well, this is all well and good, but I'm not going to practice for 34,000 hours, um, not in this lifetime and not in, probably in any lifetime. So do short amounts of practice make a difference? And so um, we've been interested in whether we can um, actually train people using very short protocols uh, and in a study that I'll describe, this is again a very, very new study, we evaluated whether two weeks of training in kindness and compassion could make a difference for the brain and behavior. So in this study, we had a two-week compassion intervention. Uh, individuals were asked to practice just 30 minutes a day for two consecutive weeks. And one of the unusual features of this study is we actually um, presented the meditation um, practice, the guided practice, over the internet. So participants logged onto a protected website where they received a guided meditation for 30 minutes a day. We recognize that that's not the optimal way to deliver this kind of practice, but it sure is a useful way to scale it up if it turns out that this stuff is useful. Um, we rigorously compared this group to a, another active comparison group that was randomly assigned to one and the other, and this was a group that was taught cognitive reappraisal training that comes straight from cognitive therapy, one of the more well-validated <clears throat> psychological treatments for enhancing well-being. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with what um, a a, a, this type of compassion meditation practice might comprise, let me just review a few of the essentials. Participants are asked to contemplate and visualize the suffering and then uh, the um, wishing the freedom from that suffering for a number of different categories of persons. And we first begin with a loved one, where you're asked to bring into your consciousness an image of someone you love. It could be a family member, it could be a friend, someone you care about deeply, and envision a time in their life when they may have been suffering. And then cultivate the strong aspiration that they be relieved from that suffering. We then move on to themselves, where they're asked to do this for themselves. And then we ask them to do it for a stranger. Now what we mean by a stranger is someone whose face you recognize someone who you encounter on a frequent basis. It might be someone who works in the same building that you work in, but you really don't know much about their life. It could be someone you take a class with that you recognize from your class, but you really don't know much about them. It could be a cashier at a store that you frequent. Bring that person into your consciousness and envision a time in their life when they may have been suffering and then cultivate that aspiration that they be relieved from suffering. We then ask them to do this for a difficult person, someone who really pushes your buttons and makes you angry. Bring them into your mind and your heart and visualize a time in their life when they may have been suffering and then cultivate the aspiration that they be relieved from suffering. And then we have them do this for all beings. They use a phrase like, may you be free from suffering, may you experience joy and ease, that they silently repeat to themselves. They're instructed to notice visceral sensations that might be associated with this practice, particularly around the area of the heart. And they're instructed to feel the compassion emotionally and not to simply repeat these phrases cognitively. And I won't go through the details of the study design, but in this particular study, they're randomized to either the compassion or reappraisal groups. They get an MRI scan right at the beginning. Uh, we then go through two weeks of training. I guess I'm being told that uh, time is up. Um, uh, so uh, the brain changes and the be behavior changes in response to this. Uh, we can do similar things with kids uh, that I won't show you because I don't have time. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm going to just end since uh, uh, time has run out, but uh, I want to um, end by just telling you that uh, if you want to know more about this work, please go to our center website, the Center for Investigating Healthy Minds. Uh, the website is investigatinghealthyminds.org. Uh, this is um, my new book, and uh, these are the many people who have helped do this work. And I want to um, end with a quote from a book that was uh, on the bestseller list for a while. 
that was written by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, which really is the, the key point of this, this lecture. Uh, and this is really the most important issue. And uh, I'll just read this to you and we'll end here. The systematic training of the mind, the cultivation of happiness, the genuine inner transformation by deliber deliberately selecting and focusing on positive mental states and challenging negative mental states is possible because of the very structure and function of the brain. But the wiring in our brains is not static, not irrevocably fixed. Our brains are also adaptable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. okay. So, uh, Richie, thanks a lot. Just one minute here. I think uh, what you're showing very clearly uh, is that uh, the brain responds to uh, interpretation and consciousness, uh, which is what context is. If, if somebody says, I love you, and you're in love with them, uh, you probably will secrete oxytocin. Uh, but if you're thinking of divorcing them, you probably secrete adrenaline, right? Absolutely. The words are the same. Yes. The vibration of the atmosphere is the same. The electrical impulse that goes to the brain is the same, but the output is completely different because of the context. Absolutely. And that context is in consciousness. Absolutely. Which influences the neural networks. And uh, this is pioneering work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deepak.